Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. Uh, I, I, have a, I have this strange suspicion that when I grow up, I want to be like this guy. Uh, very sharp, uh, and, and trust me, this is just the first time you will have heard of this man. Uh, will not be the last, because he is going to continue to change the world with everything that he's doing. And so I, I don't know if I can introduce you any better than that, Tim. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's quite a big introduction. All right, everybody. Here's Tim. <clears throat> hey, uh, how's everyone going? So uh, my name is Tim Huang. I'll, I'll try to make it uh, exciting and informative today. I know we're rounding out towards the end of the day. My talk today is entitled Playing Data Ball, uh, Online Influence and the Future of Social Hacking. Um, that's a little bit of a mouthful, so it's worth uh, unpacking. Um, the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about some uh, pretty fun experiments that have been popping up in the academic and research world in the past year uh, that concern the topic of influence uh, online, specifically how communities are uh, motivated to take action and what factors kind of lead to that. Um, in the second part, I'm going to take a little bit of a step back um, and think about these experiments and also the kind of broader sort of technological landscape that they're a part of um, and talk about how they suggest kind of an odd new universe um, that's at once pretty exciting uh, and also pretty terrifying and you'll see what I mean why um, and uh, so yeah uh, by way of introduction uh, my name is Tim Huang I'm uh, the founder of a conference called RaffleCon uh, which essentially tries to gather together uh, everybody who is momentarily famous on the internet um, to talk about memes uh, online. Um, so one prominent example of this is Tron Guy, who has showed up on a number of our events. Um, and we've had a variety of people. So uh, this year, we had the guy who created Clippy. Um, we kind of have an obsession with sort of like lame Windows uh, tropes. So we got the guy who invented Comic Sans, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, uh, David After Dentist came this year. Uh, Mahir Kagiri, I Kiss You. We actually flew him all the way from Turkey uh, to participate in this conference, and it, it was pretty great. Um, my uh, professional life actually has been from the world of research, though. So for many years, I was actually with the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, um, where I worked with a guy named Yokai Benkler. And most of our research had to do with how the design of online social spaces, right, be they uh, reputation systems, user profiles, and so on, um, govern kind of the aggregate collaborative behavior uh, of people on a website. Um, and some of this has led into kind of the extracurricular life, and most of the work I'll talk about today is from a research community that I work with called the Web Ecology Project. Um, and essentially, we're in the business of doing quantitative research on social phenomena online. And, and the big question is, um, what makes communities tick on one hand, and what makes kind of culture uh, flow uh, through the web? Um, as a quick sidebar before we jump into it, I'm also the founder of an organization called the Awesome Foundation uh, for the Arts and Sciences, uh, which is a subsidiary project of the Institute on Higher Awesome Studies. Um, and we, uh, we give out uh, $1,000 grants once a month to projects that support the interest of awesomeness uh, in the universe, uh, broadly speaking. So this involves a lot of lasers and dinosaurs and explosions and that kind of stuff, and it's pretty great. So I'm going to jump right into it, um, and because uh, there's a lot to cover. Um, I'm actually be not going to begin today by talking about technology, and I'm not going to begin today by talking about the internet or anything like that. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about a book that uh, I've been pretty fascinated with recently that I assume at least some of you have read uh, in the room, and it's called Moneyball. Um, and it's a book that came out uh, a few years ago, um, and it's, it's a, a topic that I never read about, right, which is sports. Um, and the book, you can tell, right, I'm wearing a Circuit City shirt, um, and uh, the book essentially concerns the Oakland A's, right, so Bay Area baseball team. And the big question of the book is, how do you become a winning team with only a tiny bit of money? Um, and one of the problems with the Oakland A's, right, is that they're systematically understaffed, underfunded, um, and lacking in a lot of talent that would allow them to win. Um, and one of the themes of the book is that the problem, the landscape that they confronted, made it actually really difficult for them to succeed um, because of two reasons. One of them was that the strategies for success were extremely vague. Right? They're essentially rules of thumb that had been built up over years and years of uh, playing baseball. Right? And, and a big part of this is actually how people recruited for these teams. So scouts would say things like, oh, it's great to recruit high school players. Um, not for any particular reason, just because uh, they really happen to, to like them. Now, a connected problem to that um, is that it was actually really subjective to assess value. So the way they would recruit for these teams is that scouts would uh, scour the country uh, looking for new members. Um, and essentially, value was based on um, their kind of uh, visual impression of people um, once they saw a couple kids kind of play. Um, and so this made it extremely difficult for good decisions to be made about uh, who to bring on. 
um, and favored actually people with actually a lot of money to burn, right? They could afford to operate in this environment um, by a huge number of people, and if some of them didn't work out, that was okay. Uh, and um, the big key figure in this story actually is a guy named Bill James, uh, who in 1970 actually began, um, he's an amateur guy, who actually started doing sort of large scale data mining on baseball. Uh, and two interesting things came out of it. One of them was that it was actually possible to identify opportunities that other people didn't see. Um, and the second one is it was actually, actually possible to assess the value of particular strategies, right? You're able to look and say, okay, they brought on these people, have they won more or uh, less? Uh, and so the Oakland A's actually ended up adopting this methodology and it became sort of a huge success. Um, they became sort of one of the, the highest wins to lowest cost ratio in the entire league. Um, and I think that was pretty interesting, right? And that's one case study. Um, but coming from the world of tech, um, those two features, right, that strategies are extremely vague um, and that value is hard to assess, uh, actually reminded me of another industry uh, that we're all familiar with, right? And that is the, <laughs> the industry uh, that is around uh, social media, right? You have an industry that promises to deliver wins of a kind, right? Publicity, attention, social engagement. Have you guys seen this site before? It's pretty, it's pretty rocking. Um, and uh, one of the problems is that the strategies are extremely vague, right? So how many of you have seen something uh, like this? <laughs> There's actually not a whole lot to go on. And a connected problem with that, actually, uh, is the fact that um, given that these strategies are cut so broadly, it's actually really difficult uh, to assess value. Um, and it's really difficult to say whether or not a strategy was actually successful because um, there was nothing to measure um, in the first place. Um, and indeed, the fact that you can programmatically generate these, right, I can push a button and it'll just spew endless nonsense for me, um, is, is probably cause for concern. Um, if you haven't seen this site, you totally should. It's actually great. You just keep clicking refresh, and it's like you're in like a parallel universe where no one ever says anything worthwhile. Um, and the, yeah, Zingo. Um, one of the... Uh, so, so the question today, the big question, motivating question today is, is could we get some science in there, right? Could we do for the online space what happened for the Oakland A's, and could it actually lead to success in a way that hasn't before? Um, and one of the things I'm going to argue today is, well, yes. Um, and I'm going to talk about a project that we've been involved in a little bit online um, called Social Wargaming. Um, and the basic premise of social wargaming is pretty simple. It asks the question, can you do it, right? If a guy comes to you and says, hey, I can build you a community and totally get you all over the place, um, then you should be able to respond and say, okay, well, let's just see if you can do it. Let's give you an arbitrary group of people and see whether or not you can build a community in a certain amount of time. So uh, correspondingly, the structure of social wargaming is very simple. Uh, essentially, there's a couple basic parts. We identify a cluster of users online, right, the, the purple dots and lines. Um, and then we have teams, right, the blue circles. And what these teams do is they compete to influence this cluster of people to behave socially in certain ways um, without them knowing that a game is going on. And we record the results. So that's a little abstract, so I can make it a little bit more concrete, right? So one of the first games we played uh, was a game called Triangles. Um, and essentially what we did was we set up, we identified, most of these games were played on Twitter, we identified a group of people uh, and then teams were awarded points for each of the connections they could create between a fresh account uh, and these people. Um, and not only that, they were awarded additional points if they got two of those people uh, to connect with one another. Um, and so on, right? And, and this is actually a really basic template, right? You can actually imagine setting up all sorts of games that are quite interesting. So one of them is, uh, could you get a piece of content to spread around? Um, another really cool one that we've been playing is actually, can you identify the agents, right? So there's a team that's an observer team that's looking at a group of people, and they know that some of the people are trying to influence everybody else to do something, but they don't know who those people are. Um, and so part of the game is, can you identify sort of intentional social behavior from um, sort of false or, in, uh, or, or unintentional or sort of the random social behavior that people uh, just have? Um, there's also sort of offense-defense games where we play, where a team is given a group of people, uh, the other teams are given groups of people, um, and I win if I'm able to convince your people to do something, and uh, you win if you're able to convince my people to do something. So it's kind of a, a measures and countermeasures um, kind of game. And the best part of that, this is actually that it's not hypothetical at all. We actually play with real users on Twitter who don't know that they're part of this game. Um, so this is a, a chart actually from one that we played. Um, obviously the names have been removed to kind of protect the innocent. 
Um, and uh, one of the interesting things is that social wargaming becomes a testing ground in a lab um, to test what kinds of things uh, make you trustworthy online and what allows you to connect with other people. Um, so this is an account from a team that was playing um, that kind of started to play with all sorts of things with, oh, okay, well, if I'm listed, it makes me slightly more credible um, than everyone else. And we can answer these sorts of questions because we're on the other side, right? In, in facilitating these games, we can track every move of the people on the board, and we can actually track all the moves of uh, the people who are playing. Um, and it forms a really interesting kind of visual representation as these people interact in the space. So as they compete, um, social space kind of distorts around them as they attempt to compete over uh, persuading people to do something. And on our side, we actually get to see, in real terms, how successful a strategy is, right? And we can, we can say, okay, well, if you're good, let's just run you through the same scenario lots and lots and lots and lots of different times, uh, and let's just see, right? Are you better than the average person at making this sort of thing happen? And there's an interesting part to this, um, and I, I think the big interesting thing um, is... Uh, actually, that it's opened up a space for quantitative geeks uh, to get into the social space. So we have coders and developers and, and statistical uh, sort of modelers and machine learnists um, getting into it. And they're actually opening up some really interesting strategies uh, with regards to influence online. So one of them, which is the most obvious one, right, is maybe we identify promising clusters of people. So we, we take a look at all the information that people are doing online and figure out, well, maybe if we go after the person who's the most connected, then we can go after um, everybody else, right? And that's one tactic that you're starting to see emerge. Uh, another one which is pretty cool is the idea of uh, fabricating a community that produces a certain kind of result. So uh, it's worth unpacking uh, this chart that you have up here. It's basically a, a diagram that we produced for one of our reports. Um, we basically took a bunch of major Twitterers um, and we charted when they tweeted um, and then the kind of social churn they were able to create in their followers. Right, so uh, the green here is retweets, the reds are replies, and uh, the purples are, are mentions. And what's interesting is once you start grinding this information down, you actually see some very distinct burst patterns in the way people are able to generate. And so some of the teams have said, okay, well, if the game is to spread content, all I need to do is create a community with enough people that are able to generate uh, the kind of result uh, that I want. And then finally, um, there's some, kind of some of the basic stuff that's being done around assessing interest, right? So uh, you could run natural language processing to figure out um, what people are interested in um, and what will kind of give you an edge in terms of uh, sort of connecting uh, with people. And the most frightening part of this and, and the most interesting part of this in some ways is that all these technologies are going into bots, right? So the teams reasoned, well, if we're just humans, we can only do so much to a social group. But if we're aided by sort of robots online that use this kind of technology and use it to identify targets and behave in certain ways, um, we, can, we can vastly scale up the size of our endeavors. And the vision right now um, with that technology is to make social wargaming much, much larger, right? So we eventually start playing games where I have a thousand bot accounts, you have a thousand bot accounts, and there's 10,000 people in the middle, right? And we can use clouds of these, waves of these, uh, to shape people or shape parts of the social uh, fabric in certain ways. Um, and so we could say, you know, accounts one to 2,000, I want you to go to this part of the social network and execute this program. And we know that statistically, you're able to generate certain kinds of effects. Um, so you, you eventually get to a point where you may be able to sort of shape and sculpt communities uh, on a very large scale, which I think is quite interesting, particularly kind of in this competitive uh, context. So the question is, so what, right? Like on some hand, this is like fun and interesting and on the internet and amusing and everything. Um, but what's the really kind of underlying takeaway from it? And one of them is uh, that the, a lot of the conversation around Web2, social media, whatever you want to call it in the last few years, is that it's great as a platform for expression, communication, and coordination. Um, but actually, what's interesting about social wargaming is that the underlying feature of it is that now we have huge tons of data about people. And in some ways, that allows us to treat social systems as data systems and do some really interesting analysis on how people behave um, online. And concurrently, um, there's a possibility for a rise of the quants, right? Um, you had a space that was previously dominated by vague strategies uh, and a difficulty to assess value, and you're replacing it with an environment actually where you may be able to actually run the numbers uh, on this and, and really use it in a concrete way. Um, taking from the baseball example, right, the popularity of Bill James's work and the implementation of quant methods actually eventually arrived to the point where now most baseball teams apparently have statisticians on staff. And the question is whether or not that happens uh, for the social space as well. 
And on some level, that's not too original, right? Nothing I'm saying is too, too original, right? You're saying, okay, well, there's a lot of social data and quants will be able to manipulate it. Uh, and that's, that's not too surprising, right? But there's actually another spin on the story that I think social wargaming puts in that I think is really interesting, right? The fact that people can run the numbers and figure out how to influence communities also means that there's room for people to run the numbers and figure out how to defend communities uh, against influence, right? Against intentional behavior that's trying to influ like infiltrate basically the natural state of affairs. Uh, and so it opens up kind of a weird space where um, data-driven experts play a big role not only in influencing communities, but also preventing influence. Uh, and what happened in the computer security space actually may eventually evolve uh, for the social space as well, right? You have white hats and black hats, and, and there's, there's some sense to which uh, there's a conflict between them uh, online. And it's easy, particularly at, at tech conferences, to get siloed into talking about um, just the technology, right? Just the internet. Um, and I think it's actually one of the neat things actually is to take a step back and think about what are the broader uh, implications of some of this stuff. So I want to close today actually by talking about uh, one of them that I've been thinking about uh, a lot recently. Um, and it comes from back to kind of the original idea of social wargaming, right? Uh, we're focused on people online, but there's actually no implicit reason why we do that outside of the fact that there's a lot of data, right? It's a good terrain for us to operate in. Um, but ultimately, these lines and dots are just people, and they're just connections, right? And where there's social data, we should be able to do social wargaming. Um, so I was recently struck, actually, when I saw this chart um, of uh, the United States federal court system. Um, and in some ways, actually, it has many similarities uh, to uh, the data structure that we see online, right? We have people, um, we, it takes in information, renders certain kinds of results, and using statistical information about how judges decide, could we influence that process, right? If I know what a judge is going to decide based on uh, their previous decisions, right, uh, based on their facts and based on certain elements of the law, uh, could, we, could we go in there uh, and do some hacking, essentially? And most of the academic research suggests yes. Uh, some work on judges has actually indicated that the decision pattern of judges is actually much simpler than it might otherwise seem. And there's some interesting practical implications to this, right? On one hand, we could present the judge uh, with a set of information to deliver the result that we want, right? We treat it as a statistical model, and then we put input and output comes out. Or we could actually play a game of trying to get a case as far up the Supreme, to the Supreme Court as possible. Right? Because if you think about the layers of the judiciary, right, there's uh, the district courts, there's the appeal court, and then there's the, the, the Supreme Court, um, there's just a relationship between them um, that we can data mine. Right? And the question is, can we play judicial golf? Right? Can we feed things into the system um, with an effort to maximizing probabilities of getting certain places? And this opens up a really interesting world of legal hacking, potentially, where we actually end up treating uh, the legal system like any other data system. And we do the same kind of hacky things for technical systems uh, and legal systems uh, that we do kind of what's familiar here in the online space. Um, so the question, I guess, here is where this all uh, kind of ends up. And I think it's, it's a fascinating question in, in a lot of ways. Um, but I think ultimately, I think there's a really interesting, well, obviously, ethical question here, right? Given that we have this data, given that this technology becomes increasingly possible, um, where do we end up with it? And what's sort of the proper use of it, knowing that it, it, it exists? Um, so I guess uh, I, I think the ability to uh, shape social spaces in these ways also ends up asking the question of uh, how we want and what kind of social space we want to live in. Um, and, and that being the case, I think there, there's kind of a really interesting kind of frontier ahead um, based on that information. So uh, I figured uh, I'd read the le uh, leave, oops, leave the rest of the time uh, for questions. Uh, thanks. Hello, there we go. Uh, Tim, it was interesting that you, you brought in the rise of the quants and sort of running bots through these uh, social wargaming systems. The last thing that makes me think of is the financial crisis where you've got stuff running stuff so fast that people can't deal with it and then everything blows up. So if you were doing this on a large scale, could you anticipate that you might blow up all these social media networks and basically make them fail in some spectacular way? 
Uh, yeah, I, I think the, ooh, sorry. Uh, yes, I think there's actually a really interesting uh, possibility of that, right? Um, because if you make some argument around social spaces online being run on a kind of like social capital, right, if you want to use that metaphor, right, the I idea that um, huge clusters of those identities might be fake um, is pretty akin to realizing that like most of your money is forged, right? Um, and there's actually a concern about what happens uh, there. Um, and, and how you might actually want to regulate against that, I think, is a really interesting question. But yeah, absolutely, I think there is a possibility um, there. But it's pretty interesting because I think there's, there's already that divide happening in some sense already, right? Like the fact that people say on Twitter, oh, people behave in, in like, uh, you know, such a terrible way, right? Like they're false, they're plastic, that kind of stuff, indicates that actually humans already engage in that kind of behavior. Um, so I think it, it may be that, like, yes, it's possible for that devaluing to occur, but it, it may be further than we expect. Other questions? I'm Chief. flashing back to Isaac Asimov and psychometrics and Harry Seldon here, but um, for anybody <laughs> who gets that 50, 60, 70 year old reference, thank you. Nice. <laughs> what I'm curious about is, this is incredibly creepy. And obviously the fact that you're even no studying doubt. it means it's already <laughs> happening. So, has it changed how you interact in social media not knowing what the motives are of the people who seem to be interacting on a level. Right, yeah, no, I, I yes, it has. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, uh, yes, it's incredibly creepy. Um, and actually, one of the reasons we engage in this research, actually, is the fact that if you believe that this technology is on the way, you'd rather be at the forefront and have everybody know about it uh, than the situation where you're, where you're not. Um, and I think right now I, I sleep well at night just knowing that most of the bots out there are extremely stupid, right? They're essentially running on this idea that if we push out a message enough times, at least some people will read it, right? It's kind of the Nigerian prince uh, strategy. Um, <laughs> when you get to this situation where these bots aren't trying to sell something so much as get people to behave in a certain way, I think that's a, that's a totally kind of different uh, space. Um, and, and I think one of the things I hope for is actually that you'll, you'll find countermeasures, right? You'll find a, a system that reminds you if there's a person who's a new friend online who only posts at the same time every single day, right? Or, or uh, is otherwise behaving in a way that might not be particularly natural. Um, but one of the interesting experiments that's being played around with right now uh, is a project that um, essentially is running bots through Amazon Mechanical Turk. So it becomes very difficult to tell. So the idea is you have a bot, and it sends out a task to Amazon Mechanical Turk saying, say something about your day in 140 characters. Or your friend just said blank, say something back to him in 140 characters. Um, but those people actually don't know where their content is going, right? And so essentially I have this puppet that I can drive around any way I want um, and create human-like content to come out of it. Um, and so I think at a certain point it actually becomes extremely difficult to tell. Um, and maybe we live in a world where we just believe that that might be something in the background, that that might be something that exists. But I guess it's a dumb question. Others at all? Yeah. Shoot. Quick. So, so Sorry. <laughs> my question is more towards uh, kind of what I wish was out on the web and kind of this analytics is where I see kind of it moving mm. is personal analytics for ourselves online is the ability to, like I would love it if I could take the analytics from my phone conversations, go voice to text, convert them into like a cloud of all the different vocabulary <laughs> words that I've used throughout the course of the day and then also tie in my status updates so that you get all this analytics about yourself online, the way you're interacting with people. You could even do sentiment analysis tied to those words so you could get kind of your mood throughout the course of the day. And if right. you really want to get technical, do like a Bluetooth heart rate monitor so you can see when your heart goes up and down. <laughs> right, right. And, and, and so what, what my question off of that is, is uh, how do you see what the analytics that you're tying in uh, and what is the capability of actually building a system like that based on where we are currently today? Totally, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I, so, so I think there's two sides to every technology, right? And one of the reasons I focus on the creepy side is also because it's kind of fun, right? Um, but um, I think uh, th there's actually been some experiments. I know there's a company a little while back that was like interfacing with Outlook, right, in an effort to try to get you to essentially be able to uh, socially overclock uh, yourself. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the analytics we could do actually could do a great deal in sustaining social networks, right? So, like, one great idea is um, it just reminds you that you haven't talked to someone in a while, right, as a way of kind of shaping uh, the circle of people you stay in touch with. Um, and so I think there's a lot of possibilities there that could actually be used for great good. 
um, in addition to kind of great evil. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely a possibility. Um, and I think it, I'm interested in seeing where it comes up first, right? Because one of the games that you could play is uh, doing that in some sense already makes you a manipulative person, right? So the big question is like, where do you wind up? And will people kind of adopt that more than the people who might want to use something like this, which I think is a lot far more likely? Like, cause like, for example, let's say you get in an argument with your girlfriend or you get in an argument with your boyfriend and it's all, it's all recorded. And how many times have we all had the situation where we're like, you, you said this, well, you said that. And well, <laughs> if it's all recorded, <laughs> you skip the entire argument and just go back and, and, and you can start, <laughs> maybe too, maybe it's a mood thing, but, but like tying it more over towards, you know, the positives, the social positive side of it. Um, like, and, then, and then my question also is geared towards the technical side of it. As mm -hmm. far as like the technical coding API systems, I'm not totally familiar with the backends and the, uh, the information available to pull from these sites. I'm assuming with your analytics here, if you're able to do this sort of crawling, um, my, my question is geared towards the actual technical side of it as well. Is if we're capable of even doing something like that currently with where the open, the open graph or the open state of the internet is. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot to yeah, there's a lot to go into there. Um, I mean, I think the landscape is varied. There's more opportunities some places than than others, definitely. So, are we? I just have a rule. Okay, yeah. So we're out of time. All right. Well, thank no, you very much. No, no, no. One short what? thing. Okay. One short thing. I have a feeling that I'm in a real world RTS, and you're the only one playing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Well, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was like, I don't know, are you telling me that I'm uh, like a huge douche? <laughs>